Judging Individual High-Resolution Audio Perception Capabilities. Hello, I'm Bob Shuline. This presentation was originally made at the AES convention in New York this past November 2015, and then repeated with some additional materials to the Chicago section of the Audio Engineering Society on November 24th, 2015. So here is an outline of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to start with my motivation for doing this work. I'd like to spend some time discussing the consumer electronics industry and the virtues of high resolution audio that they have been uh, promoting. I would then like to present the central theme of this presentation, which is a different approach to the perception issues. I'm going to get into the details of the elements of my study. I'm going to talk about the specifics of the judgment techniques. I'm going to cover creating and validating the tests that I've developed. Then I'll spend a little time discussing some of the individual testing comments that have been obtained. After that, we're going to uh, give you enough information so if you wish, you can build your own test system. This will include the uh, the hardware and uh, links to the software uh, downloads that I, uh, the test files that I talk about. And finally, we're going to cover some other factors that I still believe are open questions that are uh, critical to this particular issue. And we'll do a summary following that. So to my motivation, uh, High-resolution audio has become a topic of much interest uh, due primarily to the availability of audio equipment and recordings that have performance attributes that are beyond the uh, established CD, often called the Red Book CD, which uh, touts a 20 to 20 kilohertz bandwidth and a 90 dB signal-to-noise ratio. So a question that's often raised is, are there benefits to be gained with higher resolution audio? The benefits most commonly expressed are those of a wider frequency response and a greater dynamic range, such as how much is needed and how much can we perceive. But there are other perception factors to consider, which we will get into. Let's look now at the consumer electronics industry and what it has been doing to promote high-resolution audio. This has been a subject that started several years ago at the Consumer Electronics Show, which one may, might argue uh, was an effort to sell more versions of the same song, but with higher technical quality, and that uh, it would also motivate people to buy better technical equipment as well as the better recordings. Now the RIAA created a new logo and a definition for what is a high resolution recording and they said it's a digital audio program with a sampling rate greater than 44.1 kilohertz and a word length greater than 20 bits and as you can see this is the uh, logo that they came up with. Prior to that, the Japan Audio Society has created a logo to be associated with hardware, supporting higher word lengths and greater sampling frequencies. And that included uh, 40 kilohertz for amplifiers, microphones, loudspeakers, headphones, and 96 kilohertz 24 bit or greater for recording and playback equipment. This is the logo that they came up with. Uh, you tend to see both of these nowadays on, on different types of products. So the degree of audible improvement attributed to these two parameters has been widely discussed and debated. But people seem to want definitive answers. I've chosen to take a different approach to the issues. Rather than attempt one more definitive study to find yes or no answers to these questions, I focused on a new approach that I believe to be 
of more value to the creators of consumer and digital audio entertainment. The focus has been to develop a number of easy-to-take tests that will allow individuals using their own or recommended electroacoustical equipment to obtain some answers for themselves. Consideration is given to individual hearing capabilities and listening environments as part of making these assessments. Let's look at the elements of my study. I've chosen to break the audible performance attributes of digital audio recording and playback systems into three parts. The first part deals with dynamic range, which is related to the word length of digital signals. And that judgment is involved with one test that I will present. Number two deals with frequency response, which relates to the sampling frequency. And these judgments result in two tests. And three, other tests dealing with audible in-band artifacts, meaning artifacts that are within the normal audible band, 20 to 20 kilohertz, associated with the design and performance of the necessary anti-aliasing filters, anti-imaging filters, and clocking schemes used in such system. This presentation, however, covers work on parts one and two with a bit of speculation on part three. Let's start with some of the specifics of the judgment techniques. And let's look at some of the necessary equipment for making judgments. Here we see on the left that uh, one needs some program material that represents what is considered high resolution audio files. And these would be files in this case that have a 96 kilohertz sampling rate and 24-bit word lengths. And this will allow us to explore frequencies up to 40 kilohertz and a dynamic range of 90 to 100 dB. These will be played back on a device that's capable of storing them and playing them back properly. And then we're going to feed that to an amplification device which has the necessary uh, dynamic range and bandwidth to handle the signals. And from there, we're going to split our playback into two areas. One's going to involve uh, some loudspeakers. The other is going to involve some headphones. And these also will have to be uh, quantified regarding their capabilities. And finally, and most importantly, there's the listener, that's you, and the listening environment that you're in. So the combination of that and your hearing acuity are going to be uh, all put into play on making some meaningful test judgments. Let's start now with the dynamic range judgment. This rather complicated figure is the key uh, or heart of the uh, dynamic range test. I chose to use music as the test because it has high face value. And the logic is something like this. I start with a short excerpt, about 20 seconds, of a musical track played at what we call reference level. That's a level you set to be as loud as you wish, which would set your loud level. That's followed by a repeat for the same period of time at an attenuated level, which in this particular graphic is 15 dB lower. And then following that is a repeat of the reference level again. The playback is uh, best, we, we feel, I feel, through earphones. And... Uh, so we're playing back from a player, we're listening with earphones, and your task is to decide, can I hear the lower level signal? And then if you look to the left, you'll see that the uh, different tracks, 1 through 19, involve that attenuated sample being dropped uh, progressively 
in 5 dB steps. So your task is to decide when uh, you can't hear it in the attenuated form. And that's going to give you a number which will be representative of your own dynamic range uh, sensitivity along with the equipment that was used and, of course, your hearing acuity. Here's an example of what a 15 dB dynamic range test might sound like. So first you will hear the uh, 20 seconds or so of the program material, and then you'll hear it reduced by 15 dB, and then it will repeat at the normal level again. The monkey for a ride in the air. The monkey thought that everything was on a square. Buzzy took the monkey for a ride in the air. The monkey thought that everything was on a square. <laughs> Took the monkey for a ride in the air. The monkey thought that everything was on a square. Next, we're going to turn our attention to frequency range judgments. Before we continue, here's some background material that I think will be helpful in understanding the perception of frequency response. Most everybody has experienced the so-called audiometric test which produces a audiogram. The audiogram is shown on the right. The test subject is in a booth. The operator is outside the booth uh, controlling what's called an audiometer. And usually this test is a pure tone audiometry test in which tones are played at different levels to the test subject. The test subject responds when they can or can't hear the tone. And then based on this, a plot is made of the minimum level heard or hearable at uh, these different frequencies. In this case, up to 8,000 hertz. The red and blue represent right and left ear. So it's somewhat of an upside down looking graph. And uh, to interpret it, we can look, say, at a severe hearing loss situation where the hearing level in decibels has to be um, 70 dB, which is noticeably higher than for a no normal hearing person, which is in the range of uh, 0 to 20 dB. And th this is above the hearing threshold. Looking further into the testing, of hearing acuity. Uh, various researchers have done work on uh, these hearing thresholds for tones above 8 kilohertz, which gets into the, uh, the range and, uh, and concerns of the uh, high resolution audio uh, discussion. And as we can see in this case, we have a listener sound source. We're looking at the left hand picture at different angles uh, at each ear or in front. And what is going on here is pretty much the same thing. A, a known sound pressure level is generated where the user's head would be, and the user reports back on what they hear. And as one might expect, the levels have to be made higher and higher and higher as the frequencies go up and up. So the graph we see on the right is sort of the inverse of the audiogram which you've seen. And here you can see that a, a young listener, for example, uh, would have, let's say, a, a zero dB uh, sound level for perception at about four kilohertz. 
but when you get up to 20 kilohertz, it would have to be as high as 90 or 100 dB. And at some points, there is no audibility. So this shows that uh, for most all people, that as the frequency goes up, the threshold of, of hearing uh, has to be raised in order for perception to occur. Now the problem with this is it doesn't tell you really much. It just tells you that as the frequency goes up, we don't hear as well. Some people are better, some people are worse. So what I'm, looking, what I'm looking to do is to find a test that is more meaningful uh, on an individual basis. So this has led to a new group of frequency range tests. The first of these tests, which I'm calling test two, is a bandwidth test and it uses high pass filters. What do we mean by that? We mean that we're going to take a a sound that we have graphed in the middle upper picture and we're going to uh, provide the full bandwidth which is the blue and then we're going to inject a uh, high pass filter in which we give you less and less of the low frequency content and that filter can be stepped up in one kilohertz uh, increments all the way to 30 kilohertz. Now the signal that I've chosen to use, which the graph shows, is that of a recording of a chime, a uh, percussion chime that you've often seen as part of a drum kit. And that's been recorded, as I will describe in detail shortly, and played back from a uh, audio player, as we see in the uh, upper right, through a amplifier that can pass the uh, the full frequency range and bandwidth and reproduced using a select tweeter that's feeding uh, the test subject which in this case is myself uh, at about eight inches from the source and uh, we're using a sound pressure level of about 90 db so the way the test works is that you first hear the full bandwidth of the chime. Now we're looking at the graph below the center graph. So you see the, uh, the, the, the amplitude signature of the full bandwidth chime. And that's, in this case, a one kilohertz high pass sample. And then after that finishes, you hear another version of the sample with the filter in place. And in the case of this uh, particular slide, there's a 20 kilohertz high pass example. And you see that the uh, amplitude has been somewhat reduced because the uh, uh, full energy has been uh, reduced. And after that, there's a repeat of the original sample. So when taking the test, you progressively uh, step through all these variations as shown in the table at the left where you move the high pass filter up in one kilohertz increments and at some point you'll report back I don't hear anything and this will give you a reference frequency range here we see an example of the time plot when the uh, bandpass or the high pass is at 5 kilohertz and we'll play a sample of that. So you'll hear the chime with uh, the full bandwidth, then you'll hear it with the uh, 5 kilohertz high pass, and then you'll hear the full bandwidth again. So we just talked about test Two, which was using a high-pass filter. This, I feel, is a very sensitive test because all you're hearing is just the high-frequency content by itself without any other bits of music or any other related sounds. But in reality, 
if you are listening to a audio system, what we're talking about is what happens if we limit the high frequencies using a low pass filter. And that's shown in the center upper graph where we again see the uh, full chime, which is actually the dark blue curve. And then we see uh, progressively the red, purple, green, etc. curves where we are moving the filter to higher and higher frequencies. And in the graph right below it, there's an example of first seeing the full bandwidth chime and then seeing a low pass filtered example, in this case at 5 kilohertz, and finally followed by full bandwidth. So here's the idea. When you first hear the full bandwidth, all of your uh, listening skills will come into play. When you hear the low pass bandwidth, you will, at the first uh, listening, hear something that sounds very band limited and uh, not hi-fi like at all and noticeably restricted. But as the filter moves up and up in frequencies, you'll reach a point where the full bandwidth and the low pass bandwidth essentially sound the same. In other words, you don't need more bandwidth. And again, these tests are available in one kilohertz steps, uh, which you see on the uh, left-hand side, where we have a, a one to two kilohertz, and then it goes all the way up to 30 kilohertz. Again, reproduced by the same loudspeaker, amplifier, and player. So the thought here is that most likely you will get a different answer than you did with the high pass test because of a phenomenon known as masking. In other words, the lower frequencies of the, uh, of the chime are masking the higher frequencies so that most likely the answer you get here will be a lower number than you did at the, uh, when you were using the high pass filter. So here again, is an example of what these things sound like. Uh, the first thing you're going to hear is the uh, full bandwidth uh, recording of the uh, of the of the chime, followed by a low pass demo, and then the full bandwidth again. This will be sort of like listening to full bandwidth, and then AM radio or FM versus AM radio to, to use an analogy. So let's summarize what we've talked about so far. By using these three tests, one, two, and three, listeners will have determined for themselves under listing conditions of their choice, a dynamic range measure and a bandwidth measure for which they can perceive no further improvement. Now they can use this data to help them determine the benefits of these two aspects of audio reproduction relative to the claimed capabilities of high-resolution audio. Let me now talk about how these tests were created and how I validated them so that I felt comfortable and confident that the tests that are being presented were accurate and meaningful. Here we see the setup for the chime recording, and as you see, I'm using a Latin percussion bar chime, which is often used by percussionists with their drum kits, etc. And at about 12 inches from it, I placed a quarter inch flat pressure measurement microphone with the protective grill removed. I'll speak to that issue in a minute. And it's a quarter inch condenser microphone made by a company called GRAS. That microphone goes into its power supply, and then it feeds the Tascam DR100 96 kilohertz 24-bit PCM digital recorder. A little bit of detail about the, uh, the microphone. The microphone you see on the, on the left uh, is uh, modular in the sense that 
If you look at the lower left corner, you see which is called the, the electronics or preamplifier for the uh, microphone in which the uh, combination of the capsule and a protective grill screw on. Also, you'll see that the protective grill can be removed and the microphone can be used either with the grill on or off. And to cut to the chase, the uh, calibration of the microphone with the grill off, and which, is the, which is the situation that was used for the measurement, is shown in the, the lower curve in green. And you can see that we clearly have uh, a very uniform frequency response up to at least 40 kilohertz. Continuing now, let's look at the recording that we made of the chime. In this case, we're going to look at its uh, spectrum, where we're going to plot its uh, uh, frequency uh, versus its output, or its output versus its frequency. And I've got two curves I'm showing here. The uh, blue curve is the uh, output of the Tascam recorder. And the red curve is the output of the Tascam recorder feeding the power amplifier that drives the loudspeaker. We notice a slight increase in level by looking at the red curve down at lower frequencies, which I believe are attributable to a certain amount of intermodulation distortion, but they are quite low in level and uh, I believe are not a factor based on the results of, of people listening to these signals. Let's now look at the uh, sound source that we used, or the, the speaker. This is the, the tweeter. It happened to be, happens to be a tweeter made by a company called Timpani. And here's the, the model number. And I've mounted this conveniently in a uh, 90 degree piece of uh, PVC pipe to make it uh, practical to uh, position so that it can be used to ex ex provide a sound source for the person. And I've made two of these and as you can see in the plots here the bandwidth of this tweeter is pretty much uh, uniform between a thousand hertz and uh, a little over 40,000 hertz. The green curve is the background noise of the uh, during the measurement, so you can see that the signal being measured is that of the actual speaker and not background noise. Now we bring the uh, the chime recording into perspective by looking at the output of the tweeter that's playing back that same recording you saw. So here again, the blue curve is the recording output from the Tascam recorder. And the purple is the acoustic output of the, uh, of the tweeter itself, where we see a little bit more low frequency information due, I believe, to the uh, intermodulation distortion uh, aspect of the tweeter being used. The question, of course, is does that get in the way of the measurement? But as you can probably see, the uh, chime has a definite sound signature, whereas these uh, harmonic intermodulation distortion products have a different signature. So in uh, testing, one can tell if they're listening to the band-limited chime or some artifact of that. Now we see the uh, actual in-use situation where we have a test subject, again myself, sitting about eight inches from the test speaker, which is reproducing the various test signals. And the uh, presentation level is about 90 dB SPL, and that would be measured with the head gone with the sound level meter at about eight inches. And this is a situation in which all the tests are conducted. So my feeling is that this has high face value and that it's a real sound and it's being produced at what one would call a healthy level. Let's now look at the validation of the dynamic range 
recording and reproduction uh, test. If we look at this filter, we see a plot of the output of, a, of our Tascam recorder playing back a series of files in which pink noise was the signal and the signal was progressively, in this case, attenuated by 10 dB steps. And you see that uh, the actual results tend to smear together as you get down to the uh, between minus 90 and minus 100 dB, which are really a, a factor of the dynamic range of the electronics in the recorder, which is something that I've noticed on most every one of these recorders and playback devices that I've used. But you can see that the steps uh, going down to uh, minus 80 dB are quite uniform and that you do get a definite reduction when you go to uh, minus 90 and minus 100. Now these were run with pink noise. What I found when using pink noise was that the person listening would find that since the pink noise has no real information, their threshold for saying this is as quiet as I can hear was higher than if I used music because music has information in it. So I chose to use an information clip and uh, you can see the uh, picture of the CD up there. This was a uh, Linda Ronstadt with the Nelson Ritical Orchestra uh, playing the tune Straighten Up and Fly Right. And that was what was actually used to do the test. Here now are a couple of ways in which you could uh, audition this test. One would be with um, circumoral earphones or insert earphones, not shown, of course, is to listen with loudspeakers. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that the background noise in the room where you're listening is going to mask your ability to hear low-level sounds. So to make this test quite real, I've decided that it's best to use earphones. Depending upon your preference, the uh, circumoral type headphone or insert earphone are the logical choices. The most sensitive results have been observed using insert earphones because they have the ability to seal the ear canal and block out background noise, which allows you to hear lower level signals with less masking from the background noise. A good question is what sort of bandwidth might we expect from these headphones? Uh, here we're talking about um, audio that uh, can be recorded you know, well beyond 20 kilohertz. And most of the typical measurements made on earphones don't go up that high. So I've developed a technique in which I use what I call a real ear measurement. And I place a very small probe microphone, which you see in the center on the top, compared to a dime. That's about a tenth of an inch in diameter and a tenth of an inch long. That is inserted in my ear canal to the point where it touches my eardrum, backed up, backed off very slightly. And then the earphone is placed on my head in the lower left curve or inserted in my ear on the lower right curve. And we see that there is useful information being played back out to 40 kilohertz easily. This just demonstrates that there are quite a few headphones that don't have a, a complete fall off of response uh, beyond 20 kilohertz. Now we did some testing at the Chicago AS section meeting and we also did some testing at the 139th AS convention uh, in uh, October, November uh, of uh, 2015. Here are a few example pictures of a person 
doing the bandwidth and the dynamic range test. And I've organized things typically so that the person can run their own test. And if they wish, they can tell me what the results were or they can keep them to themselves. I find it most interesting that most people have no problem reporting back what they hear. In Chicago, we had a little more time and more equipment uh, to do this at the uh, meeting. This was held in the SN Shure Theater at Shure. And here you can see various people uh, at different times taking either the bandwidth test or the dynamic range test. Here are test results so far. That's as of the 24th of November 2015. And I might add that all of these test results have been self-reported. In other words, that the test was set up for the individual and the individual reported the results and uh, I recorded them. So as to test one, which is the dynamic range using music, uh, these results have ranged between about 60 and 85 dB with most of the results clustered around 70 dB. Getting into the bandwidth test first, using the high pass filter these results have ranged between approximately 10 kilohertz and 20 kilohertz with most around approximately 14 kilohertz finally the uh Test 3, which is the bandwidth test using low-pass filters, these results have ranged between 10K and about 18 kilohertz, with most around 13 kilohertz. So I thought it would be interesting to make it possible for interested viewers to do their own testing and to give them a uh, sort of a jump start on what I think it would take. Now, there's nothing to prevent you from playing back these files on any equipment that you might have, and I would certainly encourage you to do that. This will give you the answer to the question, what happens when I use my own equipment? But it may be that your own equipment has some limitations, and therefore you're not really able to test your acuity. So the next few slides show you how you might do something for yourself. This has been organized with a, uh, a certain amount of cost uh, uh, in mind. So we talk about now assembling your own demo and test system hardware. So you're going to need some kind of a player. I've showed two examples here, one being this Sony model NWZ A17 and the other the Pono player, both of which I've measured and find that they do an excellent job of reproducing the signals. And then an amplifier that is uh, capable of reproducing the bandwidth uh, as required. I would comment though that the amplifier is not of sufficient signal to noise ratio to do the dynamic range test. The uh, desire here would be to use the earphones right out of the player itself. But it's quite adequate for the uh, bandwidth test that uh, we see in the upper right. So here's an amplifier that's available from Dayton Audio Parts Express for about 88 US dollars. And uh, then there's a tweeter that I'll tell you about in a minute that uh, can be put into the tube uh, and then a sound level meter can be either purchased uh, from Radio Shack for example if you can still find one and also you can use one of many apps that can be run on your smartphone. So you're going to want to be able to verify the distance and the SPL uh, when your head is missing. So you can, as I said, you can use your own source, but if you're, you're wanting to build your own, here's a detailed plan of how I built what I did. Uh, the key parts are a uh, tweeter from Parts Express, where I've given you the part number, a right angle piece of PVC plumbing tubing, uh, a, uh, a plug cap that goes at the end 
and a uh, adapter so that you can thread it onto a photographic stand or a mic stand. And as you read through, you can find all the the part numbers and so forth. So if you want to go out and buy all these things, you can. And um, the reason I put the uh, black cap plugs at the end was to protect it as you're moving it around. And I vent them so that if you uh, slip the cap on, which tends to be somewhat airtight, you don't damage the uh, tweeter diaphragm. Next, we turn to obtaining the test files that you would need to do this. And I have provided a couple of options here. The first option is to go to a, a British website, uh, which is code.soundsoftware.ac.uk, and register. There's no cost to register. Uh, and after you register and get approved, which is not difficult to do, you can gain access to the uh, files that I've created that are uh, being stored there. And as you see in the, in the, under the circle, there's the uh, two high pass, I should say the high pass chime test, the low pass uh, bandwidth test, and the dynamic range test. You can download those and use those, and there's no, no cost whatsoever. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, you can contact me uh, Bob Shuline at uh, shuline at ameritech.net uh, for all files which I can send you via Dropbox. So as I said in the beginning, I believe there are some other factors to consider, which means that if you find that the dynamic range and the bandwidth issues are not really of importance based on what the uh, high resolution uh, files have to offer, there are other factors which I believe uh, have been and can be important. And these involve the necessary filters that are used in making digital recordings, referred to as anti-aliasing during recording and anti-imaging during playback, various dithering schemes and clocking techniques uh, that are used in such systems. But I'm speculating right now that the, uh, these are the areas which will show up differences that may be responsible for what various critical listeners say they hear uh, as differences between system com systems and components uh, reproducing high-resolution audio. And the question will then be, what does it take to minimize or reduce these artifacts to inaudibility? What I'm showing here is a, a couple of papers generated from AES conventions that I believe deal with these other factors. One was uh, written by uh, Bob Stewart and others. Uh, Bob Stewart's company, uh, Meridian, has come out with this MQA process just as a sidebar. And here he's talking about the audibility of typical digital audio filters in a high-fidelity playback system. These are available through the Audio Engineering Society. And here's another one dealing with uh, jitter, what it might sound like and how important these authors thought it might be. Next, there's a white paper that I think is interesting, which will give you some insight about something called ringing or factors that have to do with how these filters are designed. Uh, this is from a company called AYRE Air. I believe they are the company that designed the uh, signal processing for the Pono player. And um, you can uh, use this website or this URL to uh, hear about what they have to say about these things. So in summary, uh, three tests have been presented that address the two major perception aspects of high resolution audio with reference to the standard CD. One of these relates to the dynamic range of bit depth, and two relate to bandwidth of frequency response. I'm also pointing out that an area of focus for the future is to look into the perception of in-band artifacts, which I believe relate to the use of the necessary digital low-pass filters. 
So with that, I thank you for listening, and I would invite you to contact me if you have any suggestions or comments, particularly on the future uh, study area that I'm looking into. You can contact me at my uh, uh, email address, which I'm showing you here.